Good morning, everybody. It's my pleasure to welcome everybody to FBC and KC this morning. A couple of pre-welcome announcements. Uh, we've got our don donation baskets off to the side here. Uh, that's because we're observing social distancing and wearing pr protective equipment and doing everything that we can to, um, to care for and protect each other in that way. So if you would like to rise, um, we're going to go ahead and get started with our worship, singing Graves into Gardens. I've searched the world But it couldn't fill me A man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough You came along And put me back together and every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. No, there's nothing better than you. No, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Because the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace will find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. No, there's nothing better than you. No, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn mourning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. in 
custom and, and just a, a great practice for us to remain standing while we read scripture together this morning. I'm going to be reading from Psalm 145, verses 1 through 8. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and rich in love. Okay, you can be seated. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand. Precious Lord, lead me home. When the way grows drear, precious Lord, linger near. When my life is almost gone, hear my cry, hear my call. Hold my hand, lest I fall. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. When the darkness appears and the night draws near and the day is past and gone. At the river I stand, guide my feet, hold my hand, take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home.
Well, officially, welcome, welcome. Where we're gathered, we're worshiping, we're in God's house together this morning. And I just think after last week, we just give thanks again to God for the safety and healthy we, health that we've experienced another week in this place after a fall party. Um, it is just so good. And we just continue to thank you for wearing your masks and keeping them up over your nose. The windows are open, so keep that in mind. The next few weeks, we're is it we cool off to bring a jacket or a little blanket for your lap, but we're going to do everything we can to keep gathering safely in this space as long as we are able, and God willing, we know he can make that happen for us. Um, tonight we, uh, well actually let me back up a little bit. Um, speaking of health and safety, we welcomed 108 guests at Fall Party on Wednesday night. Um, 56 of those 108 were children, and 22 of the 108 were first-time guests in our building, which God is so good, because to do that anyway is awesome, and to do that in the middle of a time when so many are taking precautions and we're being so careful is just incredible. So we just ask that you continue to pray um, that God would be at work and moving, and we gave away 44 devotions, and um, hope that that will spur families on to keep talking about God's love for their family. Um, tonight, we will welcome our youth um, from 6 to 7.30 p.m., our 5th and 6th grade girls tonight, also at 6 to 7.30 p.m. Wednesday night, we will be back to regular pre programming, nursery, children, youth, adult, small groups from 6.30 to 7.30. We have one small change. The children are meeting in here, which means the sanctuary is closed, just unless you're a volunteer and have had a background check and all of that stuff. This area, our youth area, the nursery, that just helps keep our kiddos safe. And since it's getting colder, we can help that. And the children are going to pick up in the back, so there's not, we had a pretty big mass of people right here last week, so we're going to just ask that you pick up in the back um, at the southwest door um, on Wednesday night. Uh, OCC will, Operation Christmas Child, will be collecting boxes November 16th through 23rd. And there are box, boxes in the back if you want to take one as you leave. Um, and if you're curious about what to pack, if you just enter OCC Packing List into Google, the first thing that pops up is a real neat interactive. You can click on the net, uh, age that you wish to purchase for, boy or girl, and it will give suggestions of what you can purchase and, of course, what not to purchase, what is going to be pulled out of those boxes if we bring it in. So we encourage you to do that, be a part of that. And then finally, most importantly, as we keep ministry going, um, Adam mentioned the three giving stations uh, around the perimeter of the sanctuary. I will go back to my computer and post the link so that you can give on our new website, uh, give online, but just we want to keep on keeping on, and we are doing fantastic, and we thank you in advance for that.
our passage that Mike's going to be preaching on today. It's Philippians chapter 1, so if you want to join me, feel free to open your Bibles there. Um, And as Sarah mentioned, it is my custom to uh, beg and implore you, uh, please stand with me um, as we read God's Word as a sign of our reverence. Um, So here we go, Philippians uh, chapter 1. If you hit like Ephesians, go right, and Colossians, go left, you'll find it. Um, Here we are. Paul and Timothy, and and by the way, Paul wrote this when he was in jail, so you'll hear some of his references to that. Um, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God and all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all, because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of grace with me. For God is my witness, how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Christ Jesus to the glory and praise of God. Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but also from good will. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. For my, But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which to choose. But I am hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you, with you all for the progress and joy in the faith, so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Jesus Christ through my coming to you again. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you, that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, in no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from God. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict 
which you saw in me, and now here to be in me. God, you should join me in prayer. And Father, I thank you for I thank you for your word, and Lord, for how you have preserved it and through the ages for the sake of um, us being able to have it now. And Lord, I'm so grateful for the opportunity that we have to gather here in this place. And Lord, as we look forward to a very interesting week in our culture and in our country, Lord, I pray that you would put it all in our hearts to do whatever duty it is that you've, you've laid it for us to be. I'm civically responsible, but as really as believers, we look to you as the one who brings, as even Paul mentioned in today's reading, this unity and spirit, or that your name would be made known, or that your kingdom would be the one that is recognized as the true perfect government. And so, Lord, I ask that you would help us to be encouraged, or to be built up, or to live in love abundantly um, as a reflection of, of your, your kingdom here on earth. Lord, your spirit be with Mike as he brings uh, the message today. So I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, and, and thank you for being with us today. I've looked on Facebook, and I saw that we have our Facebook family joining today. So thank you if you're watching from Facebook. And then, of course, we have a, a nice gathering in the house today. So we're so very pleased that everyone is here. And I want to personally thank you for the notes and, and thoughts during the month of October that I and others on staff received because it was Staff Appreciation or Pastor Appreciation Month, and so thank you for that. And I have to tell you that I am so privileged and so appreciative to serve here, but also to serve with Sarah and David and Adam and Josh and the entire staff that, that we have, of course, Sherry and, and Julie. And uh, really don't want to leave anyone out, but the staff here is par excellence. And I am so thankful for the, the opportunity to work with each of them. I have uh, the opportunity to bring our message today from Philippians chapter 1. I also was so glad to see that so many, uh, if, if, not in, if not everyone in the house, almost everyone in the house either has their Bible open on their, on their phone or they have their Bible open in hard copy, and so that's very sweet, and I appreciate that you all be, are here prepared for uh, studying out of God's Word. So, see if you can help me with this. It's familiar. I have a joy, 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 joy down in my heart, down in my heart, down in my heart. I have a joy, 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 joy down in my heart down in my heart to stay and then it goes on I have the love of Jesus down in my heart and so it goes on and this is what this this chapter this book of Philippians is about the joy of Jesus and the love of Jesus down in our hearts and Philippians as it's already been mentioned was written as it's a it's a prison epistle along with the would have been Galatians and Ephesians and Colossians and Philemon. When Paul was in prison in Rome, he wrote these letters. And he was chained, uh, it's our understanding, 24-7 to a, a prison guard. And he took that opportunity to share the love of Jesus and the joy of Jesus, even in prison. And he wasn't only in prison. He was in prison facing, uh, all, in all likelihood, execution. And he could come at any moment. It could come any morning, afternoon, night. He could be told, this is it, man. And so he knew that he was in prison, and he knew that he faced execution, and he still had a joy, joy, joy down in his heart. And so uh, it is our hope and my hope. We're starting a new series. It's the book of Philippians. It's called Joy Driven Life. And this first study today is about being knit together, that we are together in this. And you're going to see in this passage that the friendship and the fellowship with the Philippian church, with the Philippian believers, was part and parcel with the joy that the Apostle Paul had in his heart 
We're going to see that unpacked here as, as we get into the word today. So, it is a prison epistle. It is a letter that was written about A.D. 61 or 62. It is a letter to the church at Philippi. It is a friendship letter. It is not a letter of correction. It is not an apologetic letter of defending the faith. It is not a doctrine specifically established. There is doctrine in it. There is apologetics in it. There may be some correction in it, but that is not the spirit of this letter. The heart of this letter is, I love you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, the Philippian church. I love you. All right. So how did he get connected with the Philippians, and why did he express so much love for them? So it was during the second uh, missionary journey, and it's called the Macedonian Call. And the Apostle Paul and his team, they were um, missionaries, and they were on the road, and they had headed toward Asia. They wanted to go back and visit the churches that had been planted there. They wanted to go further into Asia, and they got a no from the Holy Spirit. And this is in Acts chapter 16. And then they went further, and they started to go into Bithynia, which is in a different direction, and the Holy Spirit said, no, not here, not now, not yet. And it would seem like... The apostle and a missionary should have, you know, it all figured out. We all know exactly what God wants us to do every single moment of every single day, don't we? And so, if you're wondering what God is calling you to do, so did Paul, in a sense, in that, do I go this way? No, not yet, not now, not again. Do I go this way? No, not yet, not now. Save it for later. The time will come. And so, so it is with us even We experience that we're in the will of God, we're faithful, we're obedient, we're we're, we're striving, we slip, we fall, we get back up, we slip and fall again and we get back up. And we know that the will of God is to love God and to love people. And And we're in his will that way. And maybe we're in his will because we come to small groups and we're in Bible study. And maybe we're in his will because we come to worship and we sing praise and we read the word at home and... Maybe we are in his will, and I hope that we are, every one of us believers. But still, being in God's will doesn't mean we know exactly what he's going to put before us every single day. The opportunities that he will present to us, the doors that he will open and the doors that he will close. And so this, him ending up in Philippi, was a no and a no. And so he goes another way. And he's in the region of Mysia, and he is in in a smaller region, uh, area of Mysia, and he's in Troas. And he has a dream. And he thought he was going to do missions here. And he thought he was going to do missions there. And then he thought he was going to do missions over here. And now he has a dream from the Holy Spirit. And he sees a man in Macedonia say, come. Come to us, man. Come over here. And Macedonia is in Europe. And he goes, and the church plant in Europe, the first church plant in Europe, was the Church of Philippi. So, first Baptist church of North Kansas City, meet the first church of Europe, the Philippians. All right? We're going to be connected in other ways by, besides by being first because we know who's first, right? We know who's number one. It's our Lord and Savior. But it is on this endeavor to be a missionary, to spread the gospel, to share the good news, to plant churches, to make disciples. It is in this quest that he goes this way and not yet, not now, or you already did that go this way, and and he ends up someplace that he didn't even know he would go. Are we willing to go wherever God calls us to go? To do whatever God calls us to do? 
So he has established the church, and he's gone away, and he's now in prison, and he writes this wonderful friendship letter to the Macedonians. Uh, from, he's the, well, they are Macedonians because they're in Europe, but to the Philippians. So it is verses 1 through 6 again with me. <clears throat> Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> all right. Now, I'm going to pause here because some of your versions will say uh, that, that with the holy people, to all God's holy people, to all the saints. And I want to explain that just for a second because some of you will know or remember that this is All Saints Day, November 1st. All Saints Day. And it has a slightly different connotation uh, in, in Christendom to this denomination or that denomination. But we all agree that saints are the ones who will inhabit, inherit heaven, going to heaven. And so if you're a believer today, you have that inheritance, you have that promise. If you're a believer today, you're going to go to heaven when you go to heaven, you'll have a resurrected body. You'll be in the presence of God and Jesus, the Father, the Son, and you'll have the Spirit. So there is a reason to celebrate All Saints Day. Because you, believer, brother and sister in Christ, are one of God's holy people. You're a saint, and that is reason to celebrate. Not just on November 1st, but every day, and really every minute of every day. And to have that song in your heart, I have a joy, joy, joy down in my heart. And then continuing, verse 3, I thank my God every time I remember you and all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with you because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work and you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So we have this warm welcome to the church in Philippi, to the believers there. And he has thankful thoughts of them. He's recalling, he's remembering how they received him and they partnered with him. And they worked with him. He's remembering his fellowship with them. He's remembering that they were co-laborers in the work with him. And so, First Baptist Church, it is appropriate that we pause and remember our friendship and our fellowship. It is appropriate that we pause and remember our co-laboring for a common cause for the gospel to the spread of the gospel, to the spread of the good news. And that we, when we have that kind of recalling and remembering, that we have thankful hearts. <clears throat> I am thankful for my God every time I remember you. Well, one of uh, Philippians is known as, by many people as uh, maybe their favorite book of the Bible or some of the verses are their favorite verses in the Bible. And for good reason. It is a joyful, friendly, welcoming letter. It is a good letter to read. And one of the favorite verses of people is being confident of this, verse 6, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Until he returns, he will continue the seed that is planted in you, the seed of being a believer that is watered and nurtured by the Holy Spirit, that grows and grows and produces fruit. And your work that he has started in you is sealed and safe and secure and he will see it to completion. He's going to bring you home. He's going to bring you heavenly home. 
this is a promise that you have, and it is a favorite verse of so many, and understandably so. Continuing in verses 7 through 11, I'll break them out as affection that wells up into prayer. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you. Since I have you in my heart, and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how long, how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And um, verse 9, this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in depth and insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, Christ again, and his day, and his glory. And we're in it. We're a part of it. We inherit with him and through him, and he makes us right with the Father. He makes us sons and daughters of God and filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory of God. Wow. The first emotion that is recorded in this book, verse 9, is actually verse 8 and 9, that my affection or love for the Philippians and for Christ. And this is my prayer, that your love, likewise, we may abound more and more in knowledge and depth and insight. More love. More love. We can always have the capacity. We can always have the ability for more love. More love to reach out and befriend and witness to someone who opposes you, disagrees with you. Reach out to someone who hasn't heard the truth and loving the, lovingly share the truth. Such opportunities to show love and express love and be love uh, really do exist today in the house and outside. And so this affection, this love that Paul has wells up into a prayer that he prays for them to abound in love. May we want to abound in love, more love. You got love? Let's get a little more. Love equips us and enables us to do things that we wouldn't do without the Holy Spirit working in us to show love and express that love to people who are different from ourselves. Critical week, as has already been mentioned. Oh, you are on any kind of social media. You are reading any kind of news you know. And you also know, if you're a believer, that no matter what, you can be a difference maker. You can remain calm in the storm. You can remain certain and sure and secure in the storm. You can express love and abound in love and show love and display love to any and all in the power of the Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ. May 
our love, the love of Christ that is in us, abound like we've never had it before, this week and beyond. But certainly in the days ahead, may we be unifying, may we be building up people, may we be encouraging people, may we be showing people the way to the truth, may we be showing the people the way to peace, which ultimately only comes through the gospel and through Jesus Christ. More love, but also we'd be remiss if we didn't say more knowledge and depth and discernment. It's not just throw out the welcome mat and be permissive to anything and yield to anything and just go with the flow. It is throughout the welcome mat of love that is based on truth. It is throughout the welcome mat and be embracing in the love and truth of Jesus Christ. It is throughout the welcome mat, but be discerning and to be smart in the way of knowledge. And then... Be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness. So, fruit means work. Produce it. Produce disciples. Grow them in their faith. Meet needs of people. Be sharing and caring. One of the reasons that the Apostle Paul found such friendship and fellowship with the Philippians was because in their fellowship, they were co-laborers. They really labored in sharing the gospel with him. And even when he was away, they supported him financially without strings attached, without questions, without waiting to see if he was going to be a winner or not. Without hesitation, they were generous financially. Without hesitation, they were co-laborers with him. And they had fellowship with him. And so in verses 7 through 11, an affection that wells up into a prayer for more love, for more knowledge, for more discernment, for more fruit... And then it gets exciting, even more exciting. Starting in verse 12 through uh, 14, uh, I'm going to break this out. I'm going to give you a theme, though, for, the, for uh, verse 12 through verse 26. And the theme is going to be, how's the gospel? How's the gospel? The good news, the good news about Jesus Christ, salvation through him, that he's Lord and Savior, that he forgives, he's our propitiation, he he covers our guilt, he washes us clean, he lets us stand as righteous before our Father. He makes sonship and daughtership available to us. He gives us an inheritance that we do not deserve. That's the gospel in a nutshell. That's the gospel. So when we get to these certain segments of this passage, 12 through 26, I'm going to ask you, how's the gospel? So in 12 through 14, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me, uh, obviously his imprisonment, uh, obviously his being chained, obviously the death sentence before him, not knowing if he would be set free or, or executed. But if you really want a recap of all the things that happened to the Apostle Paul, read 2 Corinthians chapter 6.
I want you to know that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. Verse 13, as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard here in Rome, the palace guard, keeping him a prisoner, and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. So in 13, 12, 12 through 14, it is without regard to circumstances. The Apostle Paul has joy. It is out, without regard to all the things that you can read in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. It is out, without regard to his imprisonment now. It is out with, without regard to being actually physically chained. It is out with, without regard that he has a death sentence looming. It's without regard to those things. He's proclaiming the gospel and he wants to know, regardless of circumstances, personal or public or in the public arena, regardless of circumstances, the question is, how's the gospel? If the gospel is reaching people, if the gospel is changing people, if the gospel is being proclaimed boldly, then he's got joy. He's got joy. I can't begin to imagine some of the suffering that, that you have gone through or are going through. I can't begin to imagine the troubles and the trials that you have or will have. I can't begin to imagine the fears and the cares and the concerns that you have. You know them. You know them. You live them. I can only speak to mine, and I've had them. Apostle Paul says, no matter what you're going through, make it an opportunity to share the gospel. Make it an opportunity to share the gospel. And so the Apostle Paul would ask you and he would ask me, Brother, I know you're going through some tough times. How's the gospel? How's the gospel? How's the gospel? And if the gospel is good, there is joy. There is joy. Verses 15 through 18. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. So here, he's got people that oppose him, and they're using the proclamation of the gospel in some way to hurt the apostle Paul. And I can imagine some of the ways that that could happen. Certainly people who didn't want Christ to be elevated. Certainly people who would not consider Christ king would not want someone preaching Christ as king. And if you're king or emperor or Caesar... That could hurt Paul. Well, that's, uh, that's what that Paul preaches. What's Paul say? Regardless of motives, we had already regardless of circumstances. Now it's regardless of motives. If 
a true gospel is being presented, regardless of the person's motive, if a true gospel is being presented, then the Apostle Paul says, I rejoice. I rejoice. So regardless of motives, how's the gospel? How's the gospel? What do you do? Why do I do what I do? Why do you do what you do? Is it to proclaim the truth of the gospel? That's the pure, sincere heart. That's the goal. That's the desire that we should have. But if you've got any other motive, some self-aggrandizing, some self-edifying reason, I don't know. But if you have any other reason and you're still presenting the truth of the gospel and the true gospel and the one and only gospel, then how's the gospel? And if it's being shared and proclaimed in truth, then the Apostle Paul has joy. We get to verses 19 through 26. 19 through 26. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and your provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage, so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean Fruitful labor for me, yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body, more better for you. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with you, all of you, for your progress and joy and faith. So that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Well, this is somewhat similar to regardless of circumstances. How's the gospel? But now it's more crystal clear. No matter whether you're facing life or death, The question is, how's the gospel? If I live and the gospel is proclaimed, I have joy. If I die and I know that you co-laborers, friends and fellows of the faith, believers with me proclaim the gospel, I have joy. But not only that, if I die, I'm going to be in heaven's glory and in the presence of the Lord with a resurrected body and my problems will be past. And so... To live is Christ, and to die is gain. Verse 21, another favorite passage of so, so many. So how is the gospel? In circumstances of all kinds, with motives of all kinds, and even facing life and death, The question, believer, is how's the gospel? And if the gospel is good, rejoice and have joy. A joy-driven life. Knit together as believers, knit together with Christ, knit together through the gospel and with the gospel and for the gospel, We stand, and we journey, and we carry one another's burdens, and we joy together. And so in verses 28 through 30, the Apostle Paul, 27 through 30, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm, stand firm in the one spirit. Striving together, stand firm in the one spirit. Striving together. Verse 
this is how we are to press on, keep going, even when there's adversity and challenge right in our face. Striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle, and they are struggling, and that's referenced several times in the book of Philippians. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. As you're going through this struggle, Philippians, that I know you're going through, as you see me going through my struggle, Philippians, I want you to have joy in the struggle. Because beyond the struggle is the most glorious thing you can ever imagine. The thing that can keep you taking the next step and then the next step and the next step. The thing that can cause you to have hope every morning when you look around and it seems so hopeless. That's the gospel. And that's the joy of the gospel. Let us pray. Father God, we give you thanks in this Thanksgiving season for our friendship and fellowship in the faith. That we're co-laborers, the Holy Spirit working and indwelling in us for the purpose of the gospel. To share the gospel, to proclaim the gospel, and to enjoy our fellowship with other believers. And to have joy in knowing that the gospel will carry on until the day of Christ. Move in your people, O oh Lord. Work in our hearts. Work in our minds. Make us peacemakers and abound, abound in love and in knowledge and discernment and in fruit. Amen. Well, this is a hymn of invitation. It's a hymn to become a member of this church. There is something significant and important about saying, I identify with what these people believe. I identify with what these people do. I identify with who these people are in Jesus Christ. It is something significant for you to make that proclamation to this body of believers and something significant for us to allow us to work more meaningfully and deeply with you. But I'm not here to increase membership per se. I'm here to proclaim the gospel, which is to bring disciples who want to grow in their discipleship. And this is a disciple growing place. So if you're a believer and don't have a church home, somebody who will partner with you and journey with you, then this is a place to do that. And I invite you, first and foremost, to receive the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He'll meet you right where you are, no matter what has happened in your life, no matter what you're going through. He will be there. He will journey with you. He will receive you and accept you. But then you have to take the next step of discipleship and of service and of caring and of giving and being generous. The fruit. Oh, this is a sweet place. And I invite you to join these sweet people as we have this closing song. Thank you, Lori. Shall we rise and sing together our closing song? Waymaker. here moving in our midst 
worship you. I worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are we make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are we make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touch every You're a way maker, miracle worker, 
is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. Amen. Have a great week. Thank you.